cup, Lord. How many of us come into the presence of God with a cup? How many of us come with a thimble? How many of us come with one of those giant get-and-go gallon-and-a-half plastic mugs? We good? All right. Take your Bibles and turn to Matthew chapter 26, and you might want to turn to John chapter 12. Keep your finger in both places because we're going to be jumping back and forth as we look at the message this morning. We're going to talk about the things leading up to, including the crucifixion, the resurrection of Christ this month, and I want us to start with the trap. While you're turning there, let me just give you a quick update. Angie is, is doing okay. She's struggling some. She tires extremely easy and a little easier than when we first got home. So we're going to go Monday and see if there's anything we need to do different, uh, any vacations or whatever. We have an appointment on the 12th at MD Anderson, so we'll be heading out next week uh, to go down there and hopefully get all of that taken care of and on, on track there. So that's kind of where we're at with that. And uh, just a quick update for you on those things. February 22nd of this year, MSNBC political reporter Heidi, you pronounce her name? I can't. P-R-Z-Y-B-Y-L-A. I think it's Presla. Uh, they don't pronounce the B, but I, I could be mistaken. But that person, she said on MSNBC, the thing that unites them is Christian nationalists, not Christians, by the way, because Christian nationalists is very different is that they believe that our rights as Americans, as all human beings, don't come from any earthly authority. They don't come from Congress. They don't come from the Supreme Court. They come from God. Problem with that is that they are determining man or men, and it is men are determining what God is telling them. According to the Christian Post, Responding to the backlash, this is their part of their article, responding to the backlash over her comments on Christian nationalism, this, re, this reporter insisted, due to some clumsy words, I was interpreted by some people as making arguments that, there are, that are quite different from what I believe. Reporters have a responsibility to use words and convey meanings with precision. I'm sorry, I fell short in my uh, appearance. Among the passages that caused confusion was, was my attempt to draw a distinction between Christians and the small set of these people who advocate Christian nationalism. Rob Reiner has a new documentary called God and Country. It defines Christian nationalism as the idea that America was founded as a so-called Christian nation and that our laws should be based on the Bible. It also claims the, that the ideology of Christian nationalism distorts not only the constitutional republic, but Christianity itself. All of this and more is simply a trap that is being set by those who would destroy America by removing its Christian heritage. Have no doubt, this is a setup for what is coming. If a conservative wins the presidency, we will be the reason for this horrible turn of events and the destruction of democracy as we know it. If a leftist wins, it will be the call to eradicate all Bible-believing conservative Americans. It's a trap. Jesus had his detractors of the day. In his day. Even the religious leaders sought to destroy him. So how do we handle this? Good question. Glad you asked. That's what we're going to talk about today. How do we handle this? We should handle it the same way Christ did when he went about serving God. How did he handle it? He just went about serving God. He did what he was supposed to do. He served God our Father. He didn't let up. He didn't stop. He just served God. So notice with me first thing, Jesus knew what was coming. Matthew chapter 26 verse 1, and it came to pass when Jesus had finished all these sayings, he said unto his disciples, you know that after two days is the feast of Passover and the Son of Man is betrayed to be crucified. He knew what was coming. He knew what was going on because he is God in the flesh. 
He was listening to the Holy Spirit. He knew his purpose. He knew why he came, and he knew it was his time. Let's go to the Lord. Father, we ask again for your blessing on this message, this time together. We pray that your Holy Spirit has free reign, that we do nothing to, to bring in Satan. We do nothing to distract. That we, Father, we just get so engaged with you that we hear you this morning. I pray that you would take me and use me how you desire. Father, remove my will. I surrender my will to you. Do with me as you please. I ask, Father, that you don't let me get in the way. We need to hear what our duty is here, Father. We need to know that there are crazy things happening and that we are good, that you are in charge and we have a purpose. So, Father, help us to see in your Son how we are to conduct ourselves, knowing all the things that are going on around us. Now, Father, we'll walk out of here giving you the glory and the praise because you are the one that is worthy, you and your Son and your Holy Spirit. We will praise you and honor you and give you all the glory. In Jesus' name we ask, amen. Jesus knew what was coming. Now understand, he has just finished his Olivet Discourse. He has just given all the parables, uh, the, 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 the lamps, the virgins, all the different parables he gave of the church and Israel and all the different things that were going on. He's just had this wonderful time of, of teaching and preaching. And now he stops and he turns to his disciples and said, you know, Passover's about to get here, right? In a couple of days, we start the first day. We start the first day of the feast and the Son of Man is to be betrayed and crucified. And I want you to notice, the leaders were the ones doing this. Look in Matthew chapter 26 and verse 3. Then assembled together the chief priests and the scribes and the elders of the people unto the palace of the high priest who was called Caiaphas and consulted that they might take Jesus by subtlety and kill him. But they said, not on the feast day, lest there be an uproar among the people. The religious leaders, the ones who are supposed to lead and teach and minister to the people, are the ones who are doing the plotting. It was the ones who were supposed to be the, 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 the elite, the most educated, the ones who understood Scripture more than anybody. These are the ones. These are the ones who are plotting against Christ. Listen. All of the things that they're doing, notice that they went to the palace of the high priest. They didn't do this in the court of the Sanhedrin, which is where you're supposed to conduct a trial and find somebody guilty or not guilty. There's supposed to be the person who's accused present, at least two or three witnesses present to testify either for or against. But they didn't do that. They met at the priest place. They met at, and notice, Notice the title, the, the priest palace. The palace of the priest. I kind of like that part, actually. If you all want to provide a palace, I'm down with that. We'll call it the parsonage. I'm teasing, obviously. They went somewhere to a private residence to discuss this because this is something that you do in front of the Sanhedrin. This isn't something that you do out in the open because this is demonic. This is ungodly. In it is many of the leaders of our day. Those who are supposed to represent us in Congress who are plotting against those who stand for truth and the Constitution. We have a plot going on. We're watching it every day. We see it. We hear it. We see it in the news. Listen, if you want to know what's going on, if you want to know, listen to their own words. Watch some of the mainstream media. You will hear in their own words what they're doing. You're going to hear this same garbage repeated over and over and over. Christian nationalists, Christian nationalists. Notice how they tied that together. Christian nationalists. Those are Bible-believing people, people who believe in Christ, people who believe in God, that actually dare to believe that our rights come from God. You know, like the Declaration of Independence that says we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. This whole movie deal that Reiner's got going, that, that it, it distorts the Constitution, distorts what a republic is. Really, 
All of our founding documents say the same thing. All of our founders say almost the same thing. Very few of them were, quote, deists. Many of them, most of them were Christians. Read the documents, read the Federalist Papers, read the Constitution, read the Declaration of Independence. Go back to the Library of Congress and read the minutes of the early meetings of our Congress and listen to the things that were discussed. Take note of the times that ministers were brought in to ask questions because a law they were considering passing, they wanted to make sure that it didn't violate the Bible. But there's no way that this nation was founded on God just because we used the Bible and all these founders said something about Jesus and that this was important. This was going on in Jesus' day. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, they had all taken the word of God, they would all taken the law, and they would added to it. They had twisted it around to make themselves look good and to keep people under their thumb. And now someone shows up, Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. He shows up and he starts saying things like, you've heard it said of old, but I say, and he starts correcting all of these teachings. And here, this this carpenter's son, this nobody, teaches in the synagogue and people are stunned at how he teaches, the knowledge, the wisdom, the skill that he has as he, as he elaborates the word of God. And now people are starting to get healed. There's blind that are seeing, there's lame that are walking, there's deaf that are hearing, there's people who are possessed, who are clean, and they're, and they're worshiping this guy. Some of our attention is being taken away and put on this carpenter's kid. We're no longer the biggest things. People are believing Him. People are following Him. How dare they follow somebody who stands on the Word of God? How dare they? Who is this lowlife that dares to speak in the name of the Father? Who is He? Why is He teaching this? What proof does He have? So we cast out demons. He does that by the devil himself. He drinks and eats with publicans and sinners. We don't do such a thing. We're the holy few. We're the ones who know Scripture. We're the ones who have been taught. We're the chosen of God to be the heirs of the knowledge of God. We make our robes a little bigger, drag a little farther. We stand on the street corners. We pray sometimes for hours. When we fast, we make sure our faces are all distorted and I'm fasting for God. Jesus had some names for them. Hypocrites, vipers, whited graves, vile. He said, you you search the world to make a disciple, and when you find him, you make him twofold more a child of hell than yourselves. We have people like that today, don't we? Well, I, I'm an attorney. I'm educated. I'm, I'm an elite. I'm wealthy. I, I know that this is representative. Well, my job is to help you because you don't know what you need. You're not smart enough to know what you need. That's why I'm here. Now listen, it's easy to sit up here and talk about the corruption in our own government, but what about the corruption in our own churches? How many men, women stand up and proclaim to be the pastors, the preachers, the teachers of God? And their whole message is, God wants you to be wealthy and healthy, and if you're not, it's your fault. And if you want to get right with God, just send me some money. You send me a buck, God will send you ten. You send me a hundred, God will send you a thousand. You give me a thousand, God will send you ten thousand. You send me ten thousand, God will give you a hundred thousand. Guaranteed, here's a hanky, I prayed over it here. Does that fit scripture? All you got to do is, and if you'll just, just listen to me, 
Come to my church. Do it this way. This is what, listen, this verse says this, but what it really means is, folks, I'm telling you, if a preacher ever says a verse that says, now what that really means is, your antennas better go up. You better make sure that what he's telling you is exactly what that verse says. It's one thing to say, listen, this is what the verse says. I want you to understand the depth of the meaning of this verse. In the original language, it had this much more connotation to it. It means even more than what we see. But when somebody says, well, this verse says this, but what it really means is, and they give you something different, they're lying. Paul said, if anybody comes preaching anything but this word, let him be a curse and a liar. This book, this is what counts. This is the Word of God. We can trust this book. God's so honest that when He tells about the lies, He's telling the truth about who lied. He doesn't hold anything back. He doesn't change anything. In fact, He says He has bound Himself to this Word and it will not change. Nothing will change. Not even the crossing of a T or dotting of an I for our English idea until all of it has been fulfilled. God spoke these words. His Holy Spirit breathed on men to write these words. These are God-breathed words. Not mine. They're not Baptist. It's just the Bible, and we can trust it. And because we can trust it, we can see how Jesus dealt with the plotting in His day and understand that just what Jesus did, we can do. Because look at what He does. Jesus just continues his ministry in John 12 in verse 1. Now understand the time frame that we're in here. These are six days, six days before the Passover, six days before he is to be taken and illegally tried and abused and crucified. Six days. He already knows He's known from the beginning that Judas Iscariot is the devil. That a devil is in him, that he has allowed Satan to use him. He already knows. He knows he's who's going to betray him. He knows that he is going to be betray before the foundation of the world. Before God said, let there be anything, Jesus knew what was coming. The Bible says in Hebrews that he is the lamb slain from the foundation Before he created this, God knew if he created man with a free will, men would not follow him. Men would sin. Men would violate his law. Men would disgrace him. Men would do all sorts of things and would have to have a redemption plan if man was going to be able to live with God long term. And so before he created everything, he determined that he would come As Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, God with us. Emmanuel, God with us. He would come in the flesh to be the sacrifice for our sin. Robbie mentioned it in his prayer this morning. That when he was on the cross, he became sin for us. So we could be saved. So we could have the righteousness of Christ. John chapter 12 verse 1. Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to, he came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, which had, been, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. There they made him a supper. And Martha served, but Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Jesus is still going about his business. He shows up, and if you read over in Matthew, you find this is Simon the leper's house that they are in, and all sorts of things are going on. People are gathered around. And understand in this day and time, when a gray speaker or somebody came to a house, people just piled in all over the place. They, they, usually they didn't, they didn't have tables like we have. They, they sort of leaned on, on their left arm, and they ate with their right hand. They sort of kind of lounged. And then people would come in and, and kind of kind of line the house. They stand outside and listen through the windows because there was a great teacher. So there's no telling how many people are actually here. It just names a few. So here he is. He just continued his ministry. He goes to the house. They sit down to eat. And then, and then just in the middle of this is one of the most beautiful interludes that has ever been placed in Scripture. Martha and Mary are there. Martha's serving. You remember Martha and Mary kind of butted heads? 
before they were together with Jesus and Mary was sitting at his feet listening to him teach? And Martha, she was busy. I think the Bible said that she was cumbered about. She was trying to serve. And she comes in and she goes, Master, Rabbi, she's not helping. There's all these people we're trying to take care of and trying to get food and drinks and everything. And she's not helping. She won't even get the ice. He says, Martha, you're encumbered about with so many things. She has chosen the better part. You know, it's, sometimes it's, it's okay to tell your guest, hey, the refrigerator's in there. There's food in yonder. Go get what you want. Sometimes there's something more important going on. Sometimes, and I hope this is true of all of us, that sometimes we're sitting together and we, we meet over at each other's house, we sit down to eat, and Jesus starts getting talked about. Somewhere in that conversation, it turns to talking about Christ, talking about God. And instead of worrying about tending to everybody, instead of worrying about trying to be a host and serve and everything else, all of us need to sit back and go, you know what? This is important. This is what it's about. Do you remember... When I came here the very first time, 13 and a half, a little over years ago, one of the first messages I preached was on God's scrapbook. Malachi chapter 3, verse 16, it said, And they that loved the Lord spake often one to another. And the Lord hearkened, and he heard, and he caused a book of remembrance to be written before him for them that loved the Lord and spake often of his name. There are important times in our lives that God takes notice of. Like when we get together and we're just sitting talking and we've talked about football or basketball or fishing or whatever's going on or like right now we're talking about allergies because it's Oklahoma. That's what we talk about in Oklahoma. OU, OSU and allergies. But somewhere in those discussions, Something ought to change because we're children of God and we love God and we want to talk about God. That when we're together, we may talk about everything. There's nothing wrong with those things. Please understand. Don't get me wrong. There's nothing wrong with talking about those things. But somewhere when we're together, our conversations ought to naturally turn to God. Because we love Him and we like talking about Him. How many of us can truly say we like talking about God? Well, listen, you all know me. I, I have, I'm really bashful and I have a hard time speaking to people. If you get me talking about my family or talking about Jesus, it's really bad. I really have a hard time shutting up when you talk about those two subjects because those are two subjects that I love passionately. Jay can tell you, we haven't gone anywhere. I don't think we've ever gone anywhere that we didn't talk about the Lord somewhere in there. We're going hunting, we're talking about, it. we're late getting out, later than what we want. Oh, this thing said that sunup was at whatever time, but I see a light breaking over the thing there, you know. I wonder if God will be gracious to us today and give us a deer. That always leads somewhere else. If you're here on Wednesday nights, you know I have a hard time being here on Wednesday nights because me and brother, we get going. All of us should be like that. And I'm not trying to do that. It's like, oh, you know, look at me. I'm doing... But the Bible says to, to watch those that God has placed over you, God has placed as leaders and follow the end of their life. Follow their life and see if what they say is what they do. We should be speakers of the name of Jesus Christ Often and all the time, we shouldn't be able to get together and not talk about the Lord at some level because He's the priority in our life. We should be so focused, so preoccupied with the person of Christ that we have virtually no other subject. We talk about everything else, but we always come back to Christ because everything always comes back to Christ. And if we're honest about it, everything should turn back to Jesus. So here they are. They're having dinner. Mary is serving. Lazarus is at the table. But Mary, in John 12, verse 3, then took Mary a pound of ointment, a spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped 
his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Spikenard contained myrrh and nard. It was found in Syria, India, in the Himalayas. It had a very strong uh, scented, it was a very strong scented ointment, and it was imported at great price and sold at an even higher price. It was extremely costly. This wasn't cheap. This wasn't easy to come by. It was pretty much reserved to the wealthy, and Mary and Martha were not wealthy. So this had taken a long time, most likely, for her to come up with the money to save, to get this much spikenard to do what she's about to do. She takes this, and she breaks the alabaster box open. And if you read in Matthew and in John, you find that she anointed his hair and his feet. I'm not so sure that she didn't just cover him. When you read about the anointing of Aaron, the Bible specifically talks about the anointing of the oil that it poured down his head and into his beard and on down to the ground. I'm not so sure that that's not exactly what happened here. She started at his head and just worked her way to his feet. But we know two things for sure. She anointed his head she anointed his feet. And then she dried them with her hair. What a beautiful sidebar. In the midst of all the plotting, in the midst of Jesus announcing to his disciples, the time is here. It's time for me to betray, be betrayed. It's time for me to be crucified. And in the middle of this, and all this craziness and all the, all the meanness and the plotting and all the evil that's going on, Mary stops and she worships her Savior and she gives of what she has and she takes something that she has been saving and building and she pours it on Christ. And we see even Jesus' own disciples were against him. Matthew 26 and verse 8, But when his disciples saw it, they had indignation, saying, To what purpose is this waste? For this ointment might have been sold for much and given to the poor. Flip over to John 12 and verse 4. Then saith one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him, Why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? This he said not because he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bear what was put therein. Jesus Iscariot is certainly the ringleader here. He's the one that gives a detail on how vile this was. Why was this such a waste to pour out on the master's head and feet? What a waste this should be given to the Son of God. You know, it hadn't been very long ago that we talked about who he is. And here, what a waste. But I want you to notice, we stop and we go see that Judas Iscariot. But did you notice in Matthew 26, it said, when his disciples, plural, saw it, they, plural, had indignation, saying, to what purpose is this waste? The disciples, plural, they all thought this was a waste. All the men who had been walking with Christ, seeing all that was going on, all the healings, all the demons being cast out. Jesus walking on the water, calming the sea, doing all the magnificent things that he's done. Three of them were present when Jesus was transfigured. And they're all whining about what a waste this is. That money could be given to the poor. Sound like a bunch of Baptists. Well, what a waste. Well, we, we, can't, we can't invest that. You know how many times I've been chewed out for a bus ministry? Well, we can't get a big bus. Those are expensive. Those kids' dimes and pennies, they're never going to pay for the bus. They don't pay for a van. Pennies and dimes and nickels from bus kids never pay for anything. It's a ministry. Ministries cost money. This is how they are. It's not about getting money back. It's not about making God break even. Now, I hear another person say, well, we've got to make sure God breaks even here. What we need to do is just invest our money and say, okay, God, what do you want us to do? It's going to cost this. All right, we're going to give it. And trust Him to make sure we have all the resources to carry out His work. 
D.L. Moody was praying one time and a visiting pastor had come in and, and he heard him, he thought he was counseling somebody and he stopped in the hallway and he was just sitting there and he was trying not to eavesdrop but he couldn't help it and he was listening and, 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 and D.L. Moody was saying, you know, these are your bills. And if you don't pay them, it's going to make you look bad in the community. Now you made these debts, you did this, this is your business, you need to take care of this. And through the course of the time listening, he realized D.L. Moody was praying to God. God had led them into ministries. They were struggling to come up with the money to fund them. And D.L. was just being like Moses and being straight with God, saying, God, you're the one that called us to these ministries. These are your debts. If you don't pay your debts, you're going to look bad. Just like Abraham, when he came to him, he said, when, when God told him, I'm going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, he says, are you going to destroy the righteous with the wicked? You know what that will do to your reputation around here? Well, God said, Moses, step aside and come down and destroy these people. I'm getting fed up with them. And he said, if you can't forgive these people, you're not my God. Mark me out of your book. Were they being smart mouth with God? No. They were calling God to his word. Did God need to be called to his word? No. God was testing them to see if they would stand on his word. If they would take what he had taught them and stand on it and do what he called them to do. It was their test. God didn't need to know what their decision was going to be. God already knew. God didn't need to know if Abraham would really take Isaac up and try to slaughter him. Abraham needed to know that he could do it. Not God. God knew already what was going to happen. But Abraham, he didn't know. And Abraham wasn't too sure. He got up early to obey and he took him. And he knew that this was the promised seed. He knew he had to come back. But does anybody here really believe that Abraham was joyful? I'm going, this is going to be cool. God's going to make this work somehow. I don't know how it is. He knew the truth and he's trying to believe it. And do you think it was easy for him to raise a knife to slaughter his own son? God had not yet revealed his, his way out, had he? And so he finally, in obedience, gets up the courage and he goes to strike the blow. And God said, okay, stop, stop, stop. And he showed him the ram. He didn't just show him the sacrifice. He didn't just show him the substitute. He showed him that he could trust God. These tests in our lives, standing up and sticking to the truth in the midst of all this garbage is what we are supposed to do. His disciples even stood against him. The Pharisees are against him. His own disciples are against him. And listen, it, it says right here that, that Judas wasn't, this wasn't because Judas was you know, so worried about the poor. He was a thief. If you read over in Acts chapter 1, verses, starting in verse 15, it says, In those days Peter stood up in the midst of the other disciples and said, The number of names together were about 120. Men and brethren, this scripture must need be fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake before concerning Judas, which was a guide to them that took Jesus. For he was numbered with us and had obtained part of this ministry. Now this man purchased a field with the reward of iniquity and falling headlong burst asunder in the midst. And all his vows gushed out. What an appropriate end for a conniver. For a coward. Jesus doesn't yield. Jesus doesn't change. Jesus doesn't stop. Now they attack Mary for this waste upon Jesus. Matthew 26. This is in both books, but Matthew gives a more detailed of what Jesus said. Verse 10, when Jesus understood it, he said unto them, Why trouble ye the woman? For she hath wrought a good work upon me. For ye have the poor always with you, but me ye have not always. For in that she hath poured this ointment on my body, she did it for my burial. Truly, verily, I say unto you, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached in the whole world, Thou shalt also this, that this woman hath done, be told for a memorial of her. Isn't that amazing? Wherever this gospel be preached. There, there wasn't a gospel yet, right? Even the gospel of the death, burial, resurrection of Christ wasn't yet. The gospel of Matthew, the gospel of John hadn't been written yet. 
That's another 30 years or so down the road. And here Jesus the prophet, God in the flesh, is saying, when this gospel gets preached forever, it's going to be a testimony. It's going to be a memorial to her love. See, Jesus never yields on Scripture. Neither does He yield on what is right or what is righteous. Proverbs 3.27, Withhold not good from them to whom it is due when it is in the power of thine hand to do it. Here Jesus defends the defenseless. Here He renders comfort and encouragement to Mary who is showing an act of worship. Jesus never compromises on what is right. Never compromises on truth. Never compromises on the Word of God. Never compromises. Now enraged, Judas is, is committed to Jesus' death. In, in Matthew 26, verse 14, it says, Then one of the twelve called Judas Iscariot went out to the chief priest and said to them, What will you give me? And I will deliver him to you. And they covenanted with him for 30 pieces of silver and from that time, he sought opportunity to betray him. Isn't that beautiful? Jesus knew. We're going to read later, another, in another Sunday, at the Last Supper. There comes a time when Satan enters into Judas. Judas allows the possession of Satan. And he gets up to leave. And Jesus turns to him and says, That thou do, do quickly. He knew. He knew right now. He knew what was coming and who was coming by. And he doesn't stop what he's doing. He doesn't change. Folks, we know what's coming. We do not change. We don't stop. We don't stop witnessing. We don't stop meeting. We don't stop serving the Lord. We don't stop tending to those in need. We keep on going. And we don't back down from Scripture. We don't back down from our Constitution. We stand for the truth. It doesn't matter what the plot is. It doesn't matter what's coming. It doesn't matter what's about to happen to us. None of it matters. All that matters is that we serve God, that we stand on this book, that we preach this book, that we speak His name, that we show His love, that we tend to those in need, that we witness to those who are lost, and that we manage the things that He gives us to further the kingdom of God. If that means we have to do it in smaller groups, a little more hidden when we get together to preserve our numbers as long as possible, that's what we do. But we don't stop serving God. Listen, this is a building. This is not a sanctuary. We are the sanctuary of God. This is just a tool. This tool can be this big or this big. This is a tool. A garage, a shop building, a bedroom and a house can be just as useful for us to get together and meet if that's what is required. This is not the end all of church. We are church. You, me, brothers and sisters in Christ, we are the church. We are the temple of God. We are the sanctuary where two or three of us are gathered. There is God in the midst. Not this building. We and we know because God told us this is going to happen. Nothing that is happening, it should be foreign to us. None of us should be caught off guard. Look at the end of this. John chapter 12, verse 9. Much, children, much of the Jews uh, <clears throat> there... <clears throat> Much of the Jews, therefore, I'm having trouble reading this because for some reason, all the F's printed as a question mark in my text, and I'm reading off my paper because <laughs> my notes are there. Much of the, of the Jews who were who Jews, therefore, knew that he was there speaking of Lazarus being there, and they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might see Lazarus also, whom he raised from the dead. Everybody wanted to see Lazarus because he was raised from the dead. But here's the important piece to this. But the chief priest consulted that they might put Lazarus also to death because it, by reason of him many of the Jews went away and believed on Jesus. Listen, anyone associated with Jesus was at risk, especially those who were examples of his power. Everyone who had been healed, everyone who had been raised from the dead, they were at risk. 
John 15, I want to close with this verse, these verses right here. These things I command you, that ye love one another. The world hate you. Ye know that it hated me before it hated you. If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Remember the word that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. But all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake, because they know not him that sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they had not had sin. But now they have no cloak for their sin. He that hateth me hateth my father also. If I had not done among them the works which none other man did, they had not had sin, but now they have both seen and hated both me and my father. But this cometh to pass, that the world might be, but the word might be fulfilled that is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. Jesus said, you are not of the world because I have called you out of the world. And that doesn't mean we leave the world or that we play the, well, I don't hang out with sinners. I'm, you know, I'm a Christian. I don't, I don't even know a sinner. <laughs> Go look in a mirror. He told us to be in the world, but not of the world. Yeah, God's ways are different than the world. God's economy works different than this world does. The world says you got to invest money to get money. Jesus says you got to give money to get money. You want blessings? Give. You want to be lifted up? Humble yourself. You become the least, God will make you the most. But let God do what he wants. Let God do how he wants. Our job is to recognize that there's nothing that we have, whether it's physical or emotional or anything, nothing that we have that didn't come from God. That's why we do an offering. That's why we give a tithe or, or we give gifts or we, we give as however you choose. I still think tithing is there, but I think there's a valid argument. I just don't buy it. The, the, the tithing is not in the New Testament. So people say, well, I like to do New Testament giving. Okay, I'm down with that. Go with New Testament giving because the lowest percentage in New Testament is 50%. Go ahead and give New Testament giving. We won't have trouble paying our bills. We do this because it's an act of worship. We don't give money because, well, we got to. God said it. We do it because it's an act of worship. It's us saying, everything I have is yours already. I wouldn't have it if you didn't. I'm just going to give something back to you to, to do what you want to do with it because I want you to know I recognize that all that I have has come from you. If folks, we get hung in the money right there, and that's important. It's how our church functions when people tithe and, and give. But you know, that doesn't just pertain to money. That's to us. We give our talents because God gave us that ability. I'm grateful we have a pianist. We have somebody who can sing. I'm grateful we have people who can teach and people who can clean and people who can drive a bus and people who can fix a bus. People who can paint a building. How many of y'all like to paint? Yeah, two. I'm grateful for those two. The rest of it, we do it because we got to. You see, all this stuff that we do around here is about us giving of ourselves, everything of us. Preachers used to preach, it takes three books to worship the Lord. It takes a hymn book, the good book, and a pocket book. I will tell you in the military, if you had a sailor, an airman, that wasn't doing his job, we had, a, we, had a, we had a teaching in the military that said this, reach your hand in his pocket and grab his wallet and you'll get his undivided attention. What are we holding out from God? Our resources, our time, our talents, our time with him. In Sunday school this morning, we talked about being in the book of James where he says, you adulterers and adulteresses, know you not that friendship with the world is enmity with God. Who is a friend thereof is an enemy of God. Speaking to Christians whose heart was divided, 
who were committing spiritual adultery on God because they wanted everything in the world. They were living in their lust, the lust of their eyes, the lust of their flesh, and the pride of life. They were living in all of that. And how many of us today, as children of God, we go to Sunday, we come in on Sunday, we are all in, we are children of God, we love the Lord, we sing the songs, we teach the class, we listen, we do all the stuff, but Monday through Saturday, it's a different story. And we may not go and cuss and, and you know, go to the bars and you know, do all that, but, but we just don't invest in God the rest of the week. We don't read, we don't pray. And Sunday we show back up to make a show. And how many of us who have mates or who had mates at one time, how long would our relationship last if I said, hey, baby, I love you, I'll see you next week? And that's how we lived. Maybe I'll love you, I'll take care of you, I'll give to you, but listen, my priority is this. My priority is hunting, my priority is stuff, my priority is my money, my priority is my friends, my priority is my work, my priority is everything but you. But when I need you, baby, I will be there. I love you, and if anything changes, I'll let you know. Is that not what most of us do with Jesus? When we're in trouble, we're coming to God, and we're asking everybody to pray, pray, we got all this going on. But the rest of the time, I'm just doing my own thing. Oh, I love the Lord, but I, you know, it's not like I'm just going to go to work and just speak Jesus all day long. Hmm. How about praying, spending time in the Word, reading? I, I love talking with one of our members uh, just recently, talking about getting up at 5 in the morning now, dedicating time in the Bible. Never done that before, and it is hard to get up an extra hour early than what you're accustomed to getting up, what you need to get up just to spend time reading. But listen to him talk and say, man, what God is doing in my life, the things I'm seeing, the things I'm understanding. I'm excited about what God is doing. I'm excited about what I'm learning. I mean, as we open our Bible come Sunday morning, preacher stands up, teacher stands sits up to teach, I open my Bible and I follow right along where I wash the screen. But I'm following right along. How many of us go home and go, hmm, you know, that sounded good what the preacher said, but I, I, let's go look it up in the scriptures that he gave us and let's see, make sure that he's telling us the truth. Remember what I told you when I came? I'm a man. I make mistakes sometimes. Not on purpose, but I make mistakes sometimes. I am not God. I know you are floored by that. Because you thought I would just write there, just under right. You thought I could just all but walk on water, right? Yeah, no amens anywhere because obviously I'm a moron if I think that. But remember what I told you, I expect you to take what I say and match it to this book. And if it doesn't match this book, you call me on it. And if I ever truly preach error, do you remember what I told you the Bible says? Where does that get corrected? Right here. Right now, you stand up in this congregation. You don't wait in my office. You don't come somewhere. If I'm truly preaching error, the Bible says to correct them, to rebuke them sharply, publicly, so that all may hear and fear. If the preacher's teaching a lie, He's to be corrected right here in front of everybody. This isn't, let's get the men together, let's go have a chat with him. If you stand up and say, preacher, that's a lie. The Bible says, da-da-da-da-da, and you said, whatever, that's not right. You need to get this corrected. I expect you to do that. But you can't do that if you're not reading. If you're not taking what I say and following it in the Scripture and going, yes, that fits. Yes, he's teaching the truth. No, he's not. That doesn't fit Scripture. There's a plot against us. And the only way we survive it is to just do what we're supposed to do. Serve God. Read, pray, and serve God because nothing else matters. If we serve God, we'll take care of our family. If we will serve God, the church will have what it needs. We will just honor God and not back down. Well, you know, this, you, can get, you can get in trouble and people start yelling at you. 
People yelled at Jesus. They called him a devil, called him a lion, bear, called him all sorts of things. You ever see anywhere in Scripture where Jesus went, oh, well, you know, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to offend you, so I'll, I'll just go hide over here. Jesus never backed down from the truth, and neither should we. It doesn't mean we have to be jerks. We have to call people names. We don't have to play that game. But we must stand for the truth. We must learn how to love the sinner and hate the sin and stand on what this Bible says. Folks, we're allowing our country to just turn into stupidity because we won't speak up. But do you know what will happen? Yep. Know exactly what will happen. Jesus was crucified. Are you willing to follow Christ wherever he leads? That's the question. Father, whatever we need this morning, whether we need to come to you and trust your son for salvation, knowing that we are sinners and your son died on a cross for us, was buried and resurrected to free us from our sin, or we just need, as children of God, to truly learn how to stand up and, and speak up and be noticed. Not for fame, not for fortune, not to have a name. Just to be your servant, to speak your name, to speak your truth, to do it in love, to season our speech with salt, but to never back down from your word, your truth. We have no fear, should have no fear, because you give us perfect love, and perfect love casts out fear. So if we're afraid, we're not tapping into your love, and we're not sharing that love without reservation. So Father, help us with whatever we need today. Whatever we need to do with you, Help us, Father, to step out and do exactly what you called us to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to